You're looking pretty scary there. There we go. Yeah, my computer is on its last legs. Oh no. It's been there for a while. Too bad. Poor people <laughs> don't get new computers. I know. Well, you know, we could always do it again through HP. <clears throat> no. You know, and I'll pay the bill. bill. No, that's all right. Hey. There you go. Hi, baby. Hi. Well, I had another completely screwed up day. I, I swear to God, I get the weirdest, excuse my language, fucking people ever. Just ever. Off, hi, Mom. So anyways, hi, honey. Hi, sweetheart. Huh? I want to hear about your fucked up day. Well, first of all, Laura did not tell me that my, what, 230 appointment were two people. Which was fine because it's 120 per person for an hour. Yeah. So but real. they were weird. Mm-hmm. I mean, and I knew they were weird. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, you're not related, but you're boyfriend and girlfriend. No, we're not boyfriend and girlfriend. And I'm like, fine. I was just like, okay, you're. There's a sexual thing going on here. Well, he's married. Mm. His wife told him to go online and find a girlfriend. The girl that came with him isn't married, but they're having a sexual affair that the wife knows about. Because she was tired of having sex with him? Who knows? <laughs> okay. And he is probably another possessed person. Yay. Uh, just, I'm just like, really? Really? I'm over you. I, you know. I've decided you've been doing this long enough. Now you have to deal with demons. I know. I mean, not like I haven't had to deal with them anyway. Did I tell you that uh, yesterday, um, I had a client, one who I did a radio thing with. She is a little nuts, but she asked me about this house cleansing. Now I only do house cleansings and is, are we recording? This is probably a good one. Okay. Yeah. I only do house cleansings anymore. If children and animals are involved, mm-hmm. meaning that they can be harmed. Yeah. Otherwise, I don't want to do them anymore. Not that I can't, because I can. I just don't like it. It's mm-hmm. time consuming. And um, But this woman wanted me to do it, so I turned my attention, and I don't know how to explain it, but I just turned my attention to the location. And I was like, okay, no way in hell am I going to do this. Mm-hmm. I said, it's been two years since anybody has been able to stay in that house. And the last tenants or, you know, owners left in the middle of the night and left all their belongings, all of which is true. But guess who wants to buy the house, possibly? Your client. Justin Timberlake. Is it a Wolfboro? I think so. You have to do it. (laughs) Well, he hasn't bought it. The real estate agent wants it to be cleansed. So my response was, well, I wouldn't touch that house with a 10-foot pole. Mm -hmm. But they probably will because it's a nice home. Mm -hmm. So have Justin Timberlake get hold of me Mm -hmm. when they get in that home. And it's terrifying. Yeah, that would be awesome. Yeah, but I was just like, "Mm, no. But they were, of course, shocked because I could describe the entire home. Yeah. So, you know, but no, I'm not going to do it unless. I mean, it's demonically. uh, There are very, very very negative things there that can actually manipulate movement and objects and stuff off the walls, that kind of thing. Yeah, and, and scratch people, is you know, because, things like that. Is it because there used to be Native Americans or did they, you know, were they using Ouija boards or? Yeah, who knows? Because the house I don't think is that old. I mean, I certainly didn't get the 200 year old colonial vibe, mm-hmm. you know, um, it's, so whether or not it's um, the land itself, mm-hmm. um, I find that it's usually a combination, meaning that it's a very simplistic thing to say, you know, I mean, no, I'm not saying this about you, Corinne, but I mean, when people say, well, it's Indian burial ground, I mean, very well could be because remember, Indians inhabited the entire North American... Well, it's probably you know. by yeah. the lake. So. Yeah, well, I'm just thinking, yeah, it's by a body of water that's just right. like a lake. Right, exactly. To, ha- to have actually had, like, you know, like, that could be the exact spot of an encampment or a burial ground. Yeah, I, obviously, Native Americans were like, yeah, we lived everywhere, but I just think, like, by water, then the house could literally be right on top of... Yeah, because usually I'm, no, I'm not like, oh, it's a haunted burial ground, but, like... Oh, I know. 
But I think there is something. I mean, Indians were in World Bur. I don't know that it would be burial. They usually didn't bury. Every tribe's different, but they usually didn't bury their people near water because being near water was too vital, and you yeah. and you don't stay where, you know, where your dead are. However, it you know it doesn't have to be an Indian burial ground. It could just be places where Indians were mm-hmm. and where they were driven from, and they can in fact leave curses and you know uh rituals that Mm -hmm. if you can imagine you're not necessarily kindly inclined toward the people who drive you from your ancestral (laughs) homes so it's kind of like the version of the viking slash and burn Mm -hmm. you know if we have to go they wouldn't do it to harm the land because the land is mother Mm -hmm. um but they can certainly uh beseech mother to um you know mother earth to be unkind to the people who drove them away. So, but what I was getting at is, I think usually, and there's always exceptions, it's a combination, Mm -hmm. meaning that it's probably land in which there's history on the land of one way or the other. And then, you know, Caucasians as a general rule, they they build wherever, Mm -hmm. you know, Indigenous peoples, and, and I'm talking primarily Native Americans, but, you know, Aborigines, you know, um, South Americans, they they built, they sensed areas in the land that were sacred, mm-hmm. that were holy places, or, frankly, areas where uh, some tribes call them, you know, um, uh, well, there are different names for elementals right that have never been human whose sole purpose is to be stewards of the land Mm -hmm. and there are places that those stewards do not want humankind they are not it's not that they are um you know demonic or against it they don't really care one way or the other uh they're not for us they're not against us but when we go in, sort of that proverbial where angels fear to tread, and we build a home wherever we darn well please, and, you know, I mean, it's getting more and more this way all over the country, but, you know, it always shocked me how in California, they would, they would you know, they would shave down mountains and fill in valleys yeah. so that they could have more housing developments. Instead of like Oregon, which for years, homes were built in the trees, in the mountains, you know, along the valleys. In other words, you built your homes um, around nature. And this is a big, you know, it's a rather big paintbrush. But, you know, so a lot of these homes, especially if they want them by the lakes and stuff like that, they don't take into consideration that maybe... It's not where you're supposed to build. And for what it's worth, most people know. You know, most people, when they go to build, I've had people, I'm looking for a Kleenex, I've had people come up to me and want me to go over land that they were going to buy to tell them whether or not it was a good, suitable place. My response is, I don't have to go there to tell you it's not. Because, number one, you wouldn't be asking me. (laughs) But they're going to do it anyway. Or they want me to bless the land and, you know, frankly, my response is it's not a good place to build. Mm-hmm. You know, um, I am not in agreement with people who say or believe they can clear everything. Mm-hmm. I think there are some places that, as an example, you know, the, the place that we went into, you know, with uh, Sandy and Billy. Oh, yeah. That place was so heavily imbued with a history of negativity from its original inception as a bar or a tavern and a traveling stop to its, you know, its change to, uh, you know, a place where, you know, mentally ill patients were, were shoved to a place where the elderly were. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when you add to that, the people that live there at the end who practiced, you know, the occult, that is a place that I don't have enough time to cleanse long enough to make it a habitable place. And I don't think anybody could, you know, um, 
the older woman there died of uh, breast cancer. And within weeks of moving in, Sandy got breast cancer. Well, and didn't the previous owners have breast cancer? Yeah, the yeah. previous owner, the woman had breast cancer, the, older, the, the mother. And apparently, I think according to Sandy, there was a history of that. So possibly even more than one other woman. You know, so, so let me tell you a little bit about today's session because I think it's important. Okay. So this is a situation where the, the, the guy who's probably in his late 30s was pronounced dead at birth and then somehow resuscitated. He sees nothing but dark shadows and has since he can remember. And remember, I, I'm telling you this as though he tells me. I give him the information, and then he agrees with it or not. And what I said to him was, you know, I said, I, I can tell that you guys are here for a reason other than me telling you that you're having an affair and that the relationships, as such as they are, you know, yours, his with his wife and a child and hers with living with her mother who she doesn't get along with and a stepfather and, you know, two kids from two different guys. I mean, I could have, I could have given them lots of reasons and lots of ways to improve their life. The number one of which was not to have a relationship together, especially for the young woman. But I knew that that wasn't why they were there. I could feel a darkness the best way to describe it is when people come in and they sit down, I am looking, and again, there's, you know, the terminology is just so misleading because looking, I'm not really looking, I'm feeling, I'm sensing, whatever it takes to find what is wrong with them, right? What is it that is causing them difficulty? I read their energetic blueprint and that blueprint tells me everything I need to know. And most people don't come because their life is great. So I was very confused with them. And I found that I couldn't really concentrate, which is very unusual. So I looked at him and he had sort of a knit cap pulled down, kind of a beefier guy. And around both eyes were clearly marks from some kind of uh, blows. And I knew he had been in a fight. He didn't want to, even though everything I said, he ultimately said was accurate. Everything I said, he initially would instantly disagree with, tell me why I was wrong. And then I would have to patiently explain that we were talking about the same thing. But as I'm talking to him, I sense secrecy, right? And not just in him, but I sensed that there were entities or beings or even dead people that did not want to be um, known. The first thing I said to him is, I have a man who is dead, who calls you bro. He's surrounded by motorcycles. Motorcycles are huge in his life. And this is a guy who drank use drugs, tough, tough guy, fights, and he died because of these things. And he's not really looking me in the eyes, right? But he's shaking his head, yes. I said in the beginning, I said to him, you're skeptical, and that's fine. He denied all of that, right? No, no, I'm open, I'm open, I'm open. But there was something hidden about him. And... um so I said, this guy is around you and he is telling you, be careful. I was hesitant, you guys, because I don't like to be, if you will, a doom monger. I don't like to perpetuate fear. Mm -hmm. But I couldn't not say the information that I was getting. And it kept getting stronger and stronger. And he's been dead less than a year. And I was wondering why he was still around so finally, when I wasn't getting anywhere, I just looked at them and said, look, why are you here? And then he said, I have shadows around me. And I said, yes, you do. I said, 
I have to tell you, and I don't like to say this, but you are surrounded by darkness. You are surrounded by darkness. And you have allowed this darkness to be there. That's when he told me, and I said to him, you have nearly died many times. I said, you have used drugs, you drank, you may have gone through a period where you're not drinking as much, but now you're drinking more. And he's agreeing with all these things. And I said, <clears throat> you know, and he's, then he said, I see the shadows. And I said, well, there's something more than just the shadows. And then he explained that he saw this blacker than black shape, kind of amorphous shape. And that when that shape would show up, sort of darker than the dark room, all the other shadows would essentially leave. It would like they would be sucked out of the room, you know, kind of disappear, almost like a vacuum cleaner sucked them out of the room. And he said, so the, the interesting thing and the thing to keep in mind is the whole time that I'm telling him things that's frustrated because he's disagreeing, he's disagreeing. You know, I'm saying this is negative, but he's telling me, well, I'm fine with it. I'm not afraid. What I had to eventually very, it was an hour and a half, get him to understand is, well, you won't be afraid because this happened as a very young child. And so you are accustomed to it. I use the example of a tree with a parasitic vine. There are some vines that when they wrap around trees, kill the tree. But there are some vines, huh? I didn't say anything. Oh, but there are some vines that actually are benefited by the tree, and the tree is benefited by the vine. It's symbiotic. And that's what happened with him and these dark entities. And, but he kept denying that they were negative. But then he would say things like, when I try to ignore the blacker than black energy, it gets angry. And I said, well, how, if it's not negative, how does it present itself when it's angry? So at first he described it like a kid, right? That's saying, look at me, look at me. But really, as he went on, he was describing it more and more as an intense negativity that would not leave him alone. So he learned to acknowledge it. And whenever he would acknowledge its presence, that uncomfortableness that he refused to describe as uncomfortableness, but the uncomfortableness would go away. So this is an hour and a half of talking about this and, and slowly getting him to acknowledge things. Like I said at one point, I see yellow and red eyes. And he acknowledged that these shadows and this entity had yellow and red eyes. These are not positive things. And what was happening is the reason it was so uncomfortable and difficult is that he, he wasn't possessed because possession was not beneficial to this entity. He was what I called, and remember we talked the last time, he was overshadowed, mm -hmm. which is one step away. There's attachment, influence. Some people call, you know, sometimes I think of it as the opposite, right? Influence, then attachment overshadowing, and then possession. It didn't want to possess him because it could make his life miserable the way it was. And it made him feel like he had to have it there. Like he said to me, I don't want to insult you, but you cannot remove this. And I said, well, I'm not insulted. And you're right. I can't remove it but I can't remove it because it has influenced you to the degree that you believe nobody can remove it. Mm -hmm. And because you believe nobody can remove it, I can't. And you won't give me permission. Mm -hmm. And he said, you're right. 
So, you know, like I always do, I just, I explained that grandfather, my guide was going to be helping us. I said that it is the name of respect that we give to a particular guide. He instantly looked at my buffet where the skull of the bear is. And he said, it wasn't right when I said the grandfather thing, by the way, it was later. And, and as he was getting more and more agitated, you know, as the session was going and he goes, what is that skull? And I said, why? He said, because that skull doesn't like me. And he says, I'm not comfortable sitting here. Well, he was sitting in my chair mm -hmm. against the bear hide. Mm -hmm. And he said, that skull has something to do with not wanting me here. That's when I said to him, it's not the skull not wanting you. It's you mm -hmm. being, I said, it's the entities within you and around you that don't like the sacredness of grandfather. So she then says to me, well, is that why ugh, I'm actually getting chills? She said to me, is that why I have a dark shadow following me? I said, when did it start? Well, of course, it started when they got together. Well, demons, negative entities do not want somebody like him to have loving relationships. They don't want him to be happy. He would only share with me that because I said to him, I don't feel like there's anybody around you that you absolutely love. And he says, I said, so I'm not sure anymore if you can actually feel love. And he says, I can but it's taken away from me. And then I pushed and said, what do you mean taken away? And he goes, they die. So creepy. So she's sitting over there. So I pointedly look at her because what I said to her in the beginning is, do you have to have this relationship? I said, you're both here together. I have to be honest. What are you doing in this relationship? He's married. He has no intention of leaving his wife. And you're single. So what is it you want? Because this is not positive for you. So the long and short of it is at a certain point, he looked at me and said, can I die from this? My response was probably not. It's happy if you live as long as possible. Miserable. I said, but there is a chance that you could die from something like this. I said, but usually what happens is it doesn't kill you outright. It influences your behavior in reckless ways. I said, for instance, your eyes. I said, that's due to a fight. He never wanted to even tell me what the fight was about but he acknowledged it was a fight. And I said, you get in fights because you're angry and rage builds up in you. And when the rage builds up in you, you do reckless things. I said, you almost died in this fight. They pulled a knife and he just kind of inclined his head because he didn't want her to know all of this. So my response to him at the end was, I can't do anything else for you. I said, I've not done anything but validate for you. Apparently what you already know. I said, I can't, I could help you, but you're not going to let me. And I said, it would be difficult at this point. So you have a decision to make. I said, you know where I am. You know how to get hold of me. If such a time happens that you are ready to move beyond this, then you let me know. And he did give me a hug when he left and asked if he, you know, if he could call me. But this is a situation where I can't, this is one of those situations in the book where I would talk about not being able to fix everything. Mm -hmm. well, that people... 
Well, yeah, and and but people have to be willing to do the work, mm -hmm. it's like an right? Addict. Yeah, I was gonna say it's like a yeah. quitting cigarettes. If you don't want to quit smoking, or drugs, or drinking, right? Then... But it's also a very troubling one for me that I've met on more than one occasion where we could honestly say that this happening to him when he was an infant and then happening when he was a child so that it was with him the whole time, that, how do you, that's really a tragedy, right? Because at what point did he know enough? So now he would have to reach very, very, very deeply to have the kind of strength and willingness to have this removed. Like you said, he's never known anything else, right? I mean, That's right. That's right. And it's made it feel like it's his friend, right? Mm -hmm. When he acknowledges it, it's fine. When he doesn't acknowledge it, it makes him miserable. So that's one of the ways that they do it, is they make you feel like they're your companion, they're your friend. And so it's a tough one. Do you know or suspect how it became uh, entangled with him? When he... Well, this is going to sound odd. Have you ever heard of walk-ins? A walk-in is defined as a spirit, meaning an entity, a dead person, walks into a vacated body. Sometimes they walk in, usually they, they walk in at a time in which a person is either in a near-death experience, has died, you know, but could come back, but they don't because the walk-in comes into the body. At first, I thought it was a walk-in because it happened so young. But if it was a walk-in, you wouldn't be able to contact his energy. Mm -hmm. So I think what happened is it was a version of a walk-in, meaning that probably a dead person in the hospital, because that's where he was born, walked in to take, you know, advantage of being in another body, but they brought him back to life, right? So the entity sort of moved over a bit, but didn't leave. So that he grew up sort of sharing the body with this. Now, the problem with dead people being a part of you is that dead people, no matter how wonderful they are when they were living, maybe they're confused. I've had people's relatives do it, you know, who, who were so sorry that their wife or husband or child or mother or father were grieving that they stayed close to them, but it never is beneficial because they need energy to continue. And where do they take energy? From the person that they're attached to. So sometimes attachments of people weaken the individual enough that an opportunistic, and you know I don't like the term demon, but I don't have a better term for it, mm -hmm. but a demon can then take control. I think that the shadow people that he sees all the time that he's he defines as kind of chaotically scurrying around are probably deceased individuals but i believe without doubt that that black shape is demonic which is why when it shows up the others leave sense the other walk-in that you think triggered is that what you're saying or do you think um, that was a yeah i i don't know because that walk-in was it, it's not a true walk-in because a true walk-in number one takes over and it's usually very difficult to dislodge but i think 
you know, when he left his body that gave other entities an opportunity to step in. Um, you know, I asked him, I said, I feel that you had night terrors and nightmares as a kid and that your mother and father didn't believe what you were talking about. And he said, absolutely. I said, so you can only stay in a state of terror so long before you kind of get used to it. And I said, so you learned to coexist with this energy. Mm -hmm. I said, which frankly has been detrimental to you because now you don't even realize it's negative. Mm -hmm. And as long as you do what it wants, you feel okay. When you don't, you feel uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. The fact that he couldn't and wouldn't define it as fear or uncomfortableness says more about its influence over him than anything. So it's, it's, you know, it's a difficult situation. He may come back because they very rarely, um, you know, they don't stop at this, you know, eventually it increases and your quality of life. You know, I asked him if he ever felt like, he was kind of out of his body or kind of like that doing something that you don't know why you're doing it, mm -hmm. which he denied doing or ever feeling. But then he described um, sort of, you know, being he, he what he called it was it's like I'm on the outside of the world looking in. Mm -hmm. See, these are very telltale terminologies that they use. Mm -hmm. And the reason he would not really agree with me very often is because the entity did not want him to agree with me. Mm -hmm. So I don't know what the hell spirit is doing, sending me freaky er people to normal. Mm -hmm. So, so if he did come back and if he told you, okay, I don't want this anymore, what would your next step be? Well, in his case, my next step would be either getting uh, Lisa or Randy or both because it's not because basically it's a releasement okay. or in Christian terms, you know, it's a it's a um, depossession or an exorcism. And, you know, it's never wise to do, you know, depossession by yourself, especially, you know, even women when they're going through an exorcism can become, you know, can have superhuman strength. Mm -hmm. um, I would do it because that's my role. Um, and, you know, I would do the ritual of cleansing. Mm -hmm. I would call in the four corners with my sage blend. I would call in grandfather, the great spirit, and I'd call in mother earth. And I would use my song, which is uh, Amazing Grace in Cherokee. Mm -hmm. And I would basically command it to leave the body. I don't do it in the name of God or the name of Christ. Um, what I do is I first explain to the entity that it cannot stay that it has to go to its next place of evolution. You know, you realize I don't believe in hell and I don't believe that uh, satanic negative, I don't believe in satanic, but demonic, I don't believe those energies are always going to be negative. I actually believe every entity can be redeemed. Mm -hmm. And at some point they will all be redeemed um, to use a Christian term that I don't like. Um, but you know, Purified. it's, <laughs> purified purified and um so mm -hmm. i always try to basically i i try honey rather than a stick at first mm -hmm. because if i can help the entity i help more than just my client right mm -hmm. because i might be able to remove that entity from the client but now it's just loose to attach to somebody who may not have an opportunity to see somebody like me. Mm -hmm. But ultimately, if it will not leave, 
then I call upon the beings of light and love whose job it is to remove lost souls or spirits to the next place. Um, it Something like this with him would take multiple sessions, multiple sessions. And uh, I, I don't know that because of my location and because of the people that I would need to help me, I don't know. God, I look bald. You don't look you don't bald. Look bald. <laughs> my hairline looks like it's back to the middle of my, I can't look at these anymore. Anyway. Um, <laughs> anyway. Um, so I hope, I don't want to be unkind. I hope he doesn't come back because I will do what's necessary, but it's tiring. Well, it's and not it's going to be pleasant dangerous. for you. I mean, it's not, you have no control over whether he comes back or not. So it's, there's nothing yeah. wrong with saying that it's easier yeah. if he didn't. Well, it's, it just will be very dangerous. Anytime you do these things, it's dangerous. Would you put it in a jar or an object if you were able to remove the entity? Well, it depends on the ritual I use. I mean, sometimes, you know, I have them lie on the bare skin and I journey. And in my journey, I go to where the dark entity is. It's within. Oh, great. I've got new above my office inhabitants who are singing really, really bad. We thought it was, we thought there was some I, negative energy yeah. and, and you're like, oh great. And then you're like, ah, I was singing. <laughs> anyway. The funny thing is, I would rather have negative entities, <laughs> you know, I can deal with them anyway. Um, and then when I journey, I call upon my guide and whatever, you know, other guides are there to help me. And then I do the extraction, usually by sucking out the negative energy and putting it in a mason jar, where I then, based on grandfather's advice, I, you know, dispose of it in some way. Um, but this entity is no respecter of Native American ways. I would never be able to get him to agree to that kind of ritual. And it is very likely that when the entity feels cornered, that it will be sort of like your traditional exorcism where they're yelling and writhing and struggling to get away. That's why I didn't push it today, because it took a lot for me to... I had to sort of, for lack of a better word, hunt it down. It sounded like a combative sort of It was very process. combative. And he acknowledged it. The, the client did. And, um, you know, so I, I actually ended up, because I could not leave him in a situation where this entity was going to worsen. So I basically said it would be better for you to be free of this, but since you have learned to live in a symbiotic relationship and since you keep affirming to me that you are okay with it, I said, then my suggestion is that until you're ready, you just continue to do that. I said, but I will have to let you know it's, it's, I must because of what I do ethically let you know that your depression your physical aches and pains, your inability to sustain a long-term relationship, your lack of joy, your alienation, these are all a result of these entities. As I can't let you go thinking that your life has to be those kind of traits, mm -hmm. but you may choose it and that's up to you. So, yeah, and I will tell you, I have such a headache. And I looked at him, and he looked at me and said, do you have a headache? I said, yeah, I have a migraine, like you. And he goes, I only got migraines when I fought it. Mm -hmm. Creepy. Yep. Creepy. 
you know what? I have a creepy job. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I mean, there are times when I think, who the hell has the kind of day at work that I have? People I just... who work in retail. <laughs> <laughs> You know what? I used to work in retail. I agree. I absolutely agree. <laughs> the only thing is, is unless you've had a retail person spewing spit and snot and almost vomiting, oh, it's not quite that bad. So anyway, so that is my day. Okay. That was good, though. That was good information. Yeah. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to basically um, line up some questions as well. And, and I don't know when this weekend, but I'm going to try and do um, Dragon Speak. Okay. And if you want to do another session on Sunday or Monday. Okay. Just... All right. Maybe Monday, you know, afternoon, because I, I work usually, I usually get off early. Yeah, before. I have after. my last appointment for my marijuana thing on Saturday. Yay. And I'm, well, but I'm supposed to have a JPEG on a disc. Of How what? the hell do I even do that? Of what? Of my face. Oh. You have to have your face. You can't put it on, like, a thumb drive? Well, if I save it under a JPEG, yeah, you know what I mean? Most, most of your files will be a JPEG anyway. And if it's not, just go on Yahoo or Google and type in online JPEG conversion, and there'll be free things where you just, like, convert anything to a JPEG, and you just click on it, select just... Okay, I can all right. It can it be on a thumb drive or? I don't know. It might have to be in a disc. I have to look at the thing. Because the guy was like, it's so old fashioned and labor intensive. It's ridiculous. Well, both, I think both of your guys, well, dad's definitely, I'm pretty sure. Dad doesn't. Dad does not have a, a, a drive, oh, you know, that's right. on his. But I do. You have, a, then yeah, you could put a disc and just put it on there. But yeah. I would bring it. But yeah, you can also bring it in usually like. Walgreens, or Walgreens, CBS. those machines where you can get prints. Yeah, they can put it on a disc too. Oh, they can. Usually. I wonder if I could use that picture that I, that. Um, I wonder if it has to. They said like almost like a passport picture, whatever. Okay. God, you know what I'm gonna look like? Cause I'm not gonna do my makeup or any shit for this. I'm just gonna. I'm gonna look like somebody who actually already smokes pot. It's like, why do you need this card? It's you are clearly... Yeah. It's recreational here. Yeah. <laughs> God. Alrighty. Well, your daddy is so cranky. I, all I have to say is, it's going to be a long 10 years until he retires. <laughs> Every day, he says, I hate work. I want to retire. I'm like, seriously? If you do this every day, it's going to be a very, very long time. Yeah. I thought he only had like six years left. Well, he has five years if he wants to retire at 62, but there's a significant drop in what you get uh, as your Social Security if you don't go the full 67. I, I mean, and let's face it, your dad freaking works from home. I mean, I'm not saying he's not a hard worker, I know, though. but he gets like eight weeks of vacation a year. Holy shit. And he works from home. I know. And he does whatever he How wants. How hard is it? Work schedule. God. I've just about got him ready to shave off his beard and mustache, though. Because I kind of want to see what he looks like. And I think it makes him look old. Yeah. He, he, it does, because yeah. he looks like Grizzly Adams, <laughs> you know. So I'm going to, you know, he's like, oh, it'll take me forever to shave it off. I'm like. Or you could come with me tomorrow when I get my consultation at Chrome and you could have their barber do it for you. Yeah. I don't think he's quite there yet. I wonder if it's the same barber. He was going to move, so I don't think it is. But I was telling her, I can't remember the name of the woman who used to do my hair because I really liked her. Like Ashley? Chris? Maybe it was Ashley. I think you're right. I like that you remember. Well, because I think it was Shane was oh. my guy, I think. This is Dylan. Oh, okay. I don't know. Um, I'm, they, she wanted me to like commit to a haircut. I'm like, sorry, no. Uh, I, I will pay you for a 15 minute consultation, but I will not go and commit to a haircut. I said, you don't understand. 
I had cut my hair significantly once in 18 years. And when I did, my clients freaked out. Yeah. Said, so, you know, of course, like I told Corinne, I don't want to style it. I don't want it short. And I don't want to have to do anything. <laughs> Corinne, you go, then that sounds like you keep it the same. Yeah. Well, no, I was like, we talked about cut it, like not short, short. But, like, if you cut it to, like, below the shoulders, I mean, that's mm -hmm. still long enough to do a ponytail. It's just that your hair is so long, and to have it wet and dripping down your back when you don't want to blow dry it. Because if you go, if you go too it's short. It's a horse tail. Yeah. If you go too short, then you have to do it. Because it's mm -hmm. just. Yeah, yeah. No, I'm not going to do that because I'm too lazy. <laughs> I just don't give a damn. Like, today, we're not still recording me, are we? Anyway, yeah, we today, yes. I looked at my pajamas and went, they're still good. Huh. And then I thought, oh, God, I've got to buy new pajamas before we go to see Corinne and Nathan. Because you know what I will do. I know. I do not need my pajamas thrown away. My mom is like, Corinne. I'm like, I'm helping her. I'm <laughs> helping her. She's like, you don't know if she has sentimental value. I'm like, no, she doesn't like it. She has to wear the shirt inside out. <laughs> And backwards. So I threw it away. <laughs> it was a perfectly good shirt. I still had one side that didn't have holes. I know, right? <laughs> and um, stains that didn't have holes. <laughs> I have a psychic question for you. What's a good time this week to... Okay. Uh, probably Sunday if we're going to do it this week because... I can only manage energetically one major thing a day. Yeah. And tomorrow my major thing is my hair because I have to color it first and then go. And then Saturday is my stupid. Coloring your hair before you go to a salon? Yeah, but I'm just going for a consultation. She's not doing anything. You're coloring your hair before you go to a salon. Yeah. Do you get a professional teeth cleaning before you go to the dentist? Corinne, stop being logical. <laughs> I don't want my hairstylist to see my roots. Uh, maybe it would be better because she asked me if I wanted to do a color on yeah, it or I something. Think so. I think you I'm like, I'm jet black dye. What are you going to do, right? You're going to like bleach it up to red horse hair right before it melts. Because I did one time want Nathan, the hairstylist, to like give me like, you know, Corella DeVille, like white yeah. all the way down in the front. And he goes, well, we could if you want to be bald there <laughs> he goes because to take it from black to white is a lot he goes so basically we would dye it to white and then it would fall off in our hands but we could still do it he said i'm like you know i think Justin? given the option i'm gonna not do it you should let so. it, um gray streaks let your gray come i out. have mousy brown each hair I don't have, like, black hair with white streaks. Mm. I have, like, mousy brown hair. No, it, well, let's put it this way. I haven't seen my hair in decades. But when it was natural color, it was, they called it auburn. I have mousy brown. No, you don't. Mm. You have beautiful gold highlights with pink. Nope. It is not mousy brown. Yeah, it is. No. You can put your head as close as you want. <laughs> it is not mousy brown. <laughs> I can, you can put it so close I could reach through and grab it, but it is not mousy brown. <laughs> I never saw my hair as red, but like when I was in college, I remember one time it was like a the amphitheater seating, mm -hmm. but he would call on you. Mm -hmm. So I was sitting there and he goes, you with the red hair. And I'm just sitting yeah, there. He goes, you. Yeah, he goes, you. Yeah, he goes, you with the red hair. And I don't say anything because I don't think I have red hair. And then the guy next to me goes, you know, he's talking to you. I was like, what? So, but, so it would be mousy reddish with white. Actually, I said that to Nathan one time. And he goes, you wish. He goes, mostly it's just gray. <laughs> so I have no idea, except that I do know that when it grows out, I look like I have an inch wide part mm -hmm. because I've got a white scalp and then white roots. <laughs> So, I love my kids. I love you guys, too. All right. Well, I'm going to head out. Okay. Be safe. I will. You two, what are you guys going to do? Do you work tonight, Corinne? Probably not.
because Guy cancels on me all the time. But well, do something fun. Mm-hmm. I'm going to an open mic, so Crane will go with me if she doesn't have to work. Yeah. Ooh, awesome. Do you have new material, or are you just honing the new, the same material? A little bit of new, but nothing I haven't done in an open mic yet. Okay. So. Awesome. Yeah, but we haven't been to this one before, so. Okay. Well, be safe. I have visions of, like, seedy bars it's somewhere. Sta- this is a steakhouse. Oh, good. Cool. All right. Well, I love you guys. Love you. Thank you. No matter what you think, Corinne, be safe, you well, guys. You say Nathan, you're worried about Nathan going to seedy bars. I'm like, you think someone's going to rape Nathan? He's six foot one. <laughs> <laughs> they might stab him. Okay. You know, yeah. you can't do the kind of work I do without being paranoid 24-7. All right. I love you guys. guys. All right. We'll figure out a time to do it again on Sunday, Nathan. Maybe I'll have my uh, Dragon Speak worked out. Okay. Okay. Sounds good. All right. Love you, Corinne. Bye-bye. You have to hang up. I don't know how.